Cool. It's good to be here with you guys. Um, it, it's funny. Uh, last week, uh, we had uh, about the same amount of people that we have here today, but everybody sat in the back few rows. You guys have dispersed pretty evenly today, but for some reason, like a chunk missing out of this side over here. So we, we just got to work on spreading ourselves out a little bit more, guys, okay? We can, can work on that next Sunday. Just try and find some empty pockets. Everyone's like, I don't know. Is this a joke? Are you serious? <laughs> I'm excited to be here today. I don't know, I'm trying to start it off light. You guys, you, everyone doing well? We doing good? Yes? We doing good? Okay. Um, we're going to be jumping into this morning's message, but before we do, uh, Omar brought up uh, our friend Adrian. Um, now, I, I just want to remind you guys that we here at this church, like we're, we're a family of believers. Uh, when you see the, the red shirts and they say, welcome home, we, we say that because this is home for you. Um, I, many of you guys, I don't know what your home life has been like. Maybe some of you guys came from some rough backgrounds. Uh, some rough upbringings, and, and home isn't a good place for you, but here it can be. Um, this is a community of believers that love one another. We're a family. We're not just people that attend the same church. We genuinely care about one another. And right now, uh, one of our brothers is in the hospital. Uh, his wife, Zuli, was here in the first service. Um, he has some extremely significant injuries, and tomorrow they have a, a, a surgery for him. They're going to be doing a surgery on his spine. Um, so it's very important that that surgery goes well. So we're just going to take a moment and pray for him. Can everyone join with me in prayer this morning as we pray for Adrian? Father, we come before and we thank you so much for Adrian, God. We thank you for all the miracles that you've done so far, Lord God. I thank you that uh, when we walked into the hospital on the day of his injury, the, the doctors looked at, us and, looked at us and said, someone's looking out for this boy. And we believe, God, that uh, after the surgery tomorrow, they're going to say again, someone's looking out for this boy, God. We're believing that uh, you're going to guide the hands of the surgeons, Father, uh, that you're going to take them as far as they can go humanly, God, and then even farther than any human can go because your Holy Spirit will be upon them, God. Um, God, that you will do a miracle on that operating table, Father God, that he'll recover in ways that the doctors never thought possible, Father. God, that every time they say he'll never walk again, God, that you'll say, yes, he will. Um, and that you'll restore, God, what was damaged in this accident, Lord God. And we pray for Zuli as well, God, that she'll have peace during the surgery, Father, uh, and that you'll be over that family, Father God, and that we all will begin to understand a little bit more, God, that this is just the beginning of a testimony, God, and that, that you're doing something amazing in his life. And we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you guys, uh, you brought your Bibles this morning? If you brought your Bibles, let me see them. Wave them up in the air. Uh, I want to challenge you guys to do something. Um, the Bible is the most common book in the world. If I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong on the statistics, but I think that there's 1.5 Bibles for every American uh, in this country. Uh, so that means that everybody has a Bible. I want you to bring them to church over the course of the sermon series. There is absolutely nothing wrong with having a Bible on your phone. It's the best invention since butter. Um, but... Uh, I want to encourage you guys to just bring a physical Bible because I think a lot of times when a Bible's on our phone, when we go to our phone, we tend to maybe look at other things other than the Bible, and perhaps it might be a good idea for us to get back to basics. Uh, so I encourage you guys over the course of the sermon series, bring a, a physical Bible so you guys can follow along. I want you guys to get in the habit of opening up the Word of God and following along so it's not just words from a stage, but it's words from God's love letter to you, to you. And so I, I want you guys to try and do that. If you don't have a Bible, we will give you a Bible. We don't want anyone coming to church here that doesn't have access to a Bible. We will give them away for free. So make sure to grab one if you don't have one. If you have a Bible, it doesn't matter if it's glowing or if it's got pages, please turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Um, how many of you guys were here last week? Let me see some hands. We were here last week. We heard the message. Okay, cool. Uh, so last week we looked at 1 John chapter 1. If you missed it, I would just encourage you to go onto our social media, our YouTube, SoundCloud, and you can listen to it on podcast or watch it um, on, you know, I was going to say watch it on your way to work, but you want to listen to it on your way to work, not watch it. Bad idea. Um, but check out the sermon so you guys can make sure that you're following along with us. Um, but we're just going to jump right into the message. And normally I like to tell a lot of stories. I like to try and work some jokes into my message. But today there's just so much content in this chapter. I want to teach through the whole entire chapter today if I can. And uh, so I'm just going to try and cut out a lot of the jokes and a lot of the fluff and just get right to the Word of God and let it speak for itself. Are you guys good with that this morning? So jumping in, you got your Bible, or you turn to the book of 1 John chapter 2, uh, chapter two say I'm there. there. Awesome. Uh, it was not enough I'm theirs, but you guys get there. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, starting right off, it says, My dear children, I am writing this to you so you will not sin. That's a good place to stop for a second. Like the, John is, is speaking from somebody that's dealt with a lot of people, right? 
Like, this is pretty much just every pastor, when they get up to preach, they're like, just stop sinning, you know? How many parents in the room? I got any parents? How many guys, you ever try that with your kids? Just stop sinning, you know? Like, you're just driving, and you're like, I, I don't even need to know which one of you is acting up. My shoe will just find all y'all, and God can sort out the mess, okay? Like, we've, we've been there before, you know? Like, just stop it. Just stop it. I'm telling you this so that you don't have to make a dumb mistake. We've all been there before, and the, the Apostle John is writing this saying, stop it. Just cut it out. How many of you guys know there, there's still sin in the church? Am I right? Like, this isn't a perfect place. Am I right? Are you guys with me? It's not a perfect place. I went to a church one time, and they had a big sign above the door. It said, no perfect people allowed. I'm like, oh, I obviously can't go in then, and I had to walk away. But... <laughs> That was a joke. <laughs> you guys are like, definitely a joke. But we know that even in the church, there's still sin. There, we still make mistakes. We still do dumb stuff. And the Apostle John saying, listen, I'm writing this so that you can avoid making the stupid mistake. You ever try and warn somebody who's about to do something you've already done dumb, and you're like, listen, I paid your dumb tax. You don't have to do it again. Live from my, learn from my mistakes. He's writing that. And, and, and I think that for a lot of us in church, see, a lot of times, I, I, I think that we're so focused on keeping people to not sin that we miss what comes next. And he says, see, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin, but. Everyone say but. but. Say it's all about the buts. I can't believe you guys said that. I can't believe you guys said that. That's disgusting. He's, he says, but if anyone does sin, how many guys that's you? If anyone does sin, say that's me. Uh, you got to say it like, say it like you've done something stupid lately. Say, that's me. Uh, the people in the back say, yo, that's really me. Oh, come on. We know why you're sitting in the back today. Come on now. <laughs> but he says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous, a.k.a. the one who knows what he's doing. How many guys are thankful that Jesus is the righteous one, that Jesus is the redeemer, that Jesus is the savior, that Jesus is the perfect spotless sacrifice? How many guys excited and thankful that Jesus at least knew what he's doing? The Bible says that God sent him who knew no sin to become sin for us. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ showed up on the scene. How many of you guys, you ever get neck deep in something that you don't understand and somebody that knows what they're doing shows up and you get excited? Anybody? Oh, I, I just thank God, okay? There's a lot of things that I do because I'm confident and then I get neck deep in it. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. It's a characteristic of a man, okay? Okay. Just, I don't need instructions. I'm going to figure it out. And there's, there's a lot of times where I'm trying to do things particularly handy. Anybody ever get stuck doing something handy and it's just not working out? There's a guy that comes to this church. His name's Eric Rennie. For any guys that know him, know that he is literally like, like God, when he was mixing the formula to make like the most masculine dude, he made Eric Rennie. And he just gave him a little dose of everything and just said, oh, he can just, he can do whatever he puts his mind to. Let's just make him perfect. And he can go into that church that only perfect people. And, and I, 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 it's funny because every time I'm working on like a handy project and I'm just like to that point where I want to scream and like punch the project, like Eric shows up and there's like this sense of relief. Why? Because I know he can do it. I know he can do it. And when he shows up, that means it's going to get done. When he shows up, that means that whatever mess I made, he can unmake because he actually is the one with the ability to perform the task. In the same way, you might have gone and messed up your life. You might have gone and sinned. You might have gone and screwed things up. But Jesus, the one who knows what he's doing, the righteous one, showed up and said, hey, listen, you've been making a mess of this so far, so let me go and put my hands on it and make it right. Hey, you've been speaking some death into your family every time you're screaming and flying off the handle. Let me just speak some peace into the situation right now. Hey, let me just stop you for a second right now because you're blowing through your money, spending on stupid things, but I'm going to teach you how to be generous and how to lift people up out of their misery with the finances that I blessed you with. Hey, let me just step into the situation real quick that you're about to destroy and disintegrate and let me put it back together because I am the one that fixes broken pieces. Aren't you glad? You guys can get excited. It's church, you guys, okay? I'm not a doctor. I don't have like a negative prognosis for you this morning. It's all good things. Say it's all good. 
You guys got a reason for joy this morning. I'm going to preach to the people in the back because y'all need to get a little bit excited. You guys got to move around a little bit. Shake your shoulders. Get into it today. And I remember you guys, like, see, see, here's the thing. I think that sometimes in church, we get things a little bit backward. We make church about getting people to not sin. And every sermon that we preach is about, hey, stop it. Hey, don't do it. We're like the beginning, the first verse of this chapter. And, and we, we see people around us, and maybe even sometimes that's our approach to parenting, just telling our kids to cut it out and to stop. Are you with me? And everything becomes about prevention, and we forget about the but. Don't forget about the but, okay? Don't forget about it. Those of you guys that are laughing, y'all nasty. <laughs> and I grew up in church. How many people grew up in church? Anybody? Grew up in church. Now, I grew up in church, and I remember, like, growing up in church, there was no buts. There was no buts in church. And I remember growing up, like, just, just I, I felt like I had to get saved Every week. Anybody grew up in church, you know what I'm talking about. You got to get saved every single Sunday. Every Sunday. Every week I come into church because I know I done back talk my mama and I put gum on the bottom of a desk and I pulled that girl's pigtail on the playground. And I come into church. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Take me back. I used to repent all the time. I remember there was this movie that, my, uh, that we used to show in this, the church when I was growing up. It was an old Christian movie. It was called Final Exit. And in the movie, they get in a car crash, and they go and they stand before God. And if, if they go into heaven, God's like, stand to, uh, move to the, the right. If they go into hell, God's like, yo, go to the left. And I, I just remember as a kid, just be like, God, please. I want to go right, God. I want to go right, Jesus. Please let me go right, Jesus. I don't want to go left, Jesus. I've done so much wrong. I forgot about the butt. Are you with me? Forgot about the butt. And all I could think about was, was that I had sinned, that I had done wrong. But, but, for any of us that do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an advocate with the Father. One of the greatest revelations of my life is that my salvation isn't fragile. Turn to your neighbor this morning and say, the blood ain't broke. The blood of Jesus, listen to me, church, the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to cover your oops. Okay? The grace of God is sufficient enough to cover your failures. If any of you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. You have an advocate with the Father. Verse 2 says this, he himself, who's it talking about? <laughs> How come I got little kids in the front that are shouting out answers to me and all y'all grown people in the back? And got, who's it talking about? He himself. Who's it talking about in the back? It's talking about Jesus. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. That's some pretty big atonement if it's big enough to cover not just your sins, but the sins of all the world. How many guys, like Jesus has enough work on his hands just atoning for your sins? Now extrapolate that out across the entire world. That is how powerful his sacrifice is. And I want to let you know something, church. My righteousness before God is not predicated on my ability, my theology, or my purity. It's on Christ alone. And I'm thankful for that because I'd be a pretty messed up person if my ability to be righteous in God's eyes was based upon my ability to perform, my ability to know my ability to communicate. Are you with me, church? But it's not. When God looks at me, he doesn't see any sermon I've ever preached, any book I've ever read, any deed I've ever done. He just sees Jesus. Are you with me, church? That's all that he sees. Because God's, Jesus' sacrifice atones. The definition of the word atone is to make right a wrong. You take something that was wrong and you make it right. I'm not just talking about something's broken and you put glue on it and you put it back together. I'm talking about it's made as if it never broke in the first place, church. Are you with me? That's what atonement is. Jesus atoned for my sin. So, church, I want you to stop living in shame for all the wrong you've ever done because your wrong has been made right and your dark has been made light. That's for all the poets in the room, okay? Everything. <laughs> you got that? I'm a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> Ch 
Church, I see so many people, like, I stand up here a lot, so I have a unique perspective of, of people in the congregation, man. Sometimes when I'm preaching, uh, I, I see people crying out in the congregation. Sometimes when people come up to the front, like, they have tears in their eyes and they're weeping. And I know why. When they come up, they have tears in their eyes and they're, they're crying. It's because they're thinking of all the bad things that got them to this point. More often than not, that's the situation. People are coming up, I'm so unworthy. God, I'm so, I'm so simple. God, I'm so dirty. God, it's so wrong. Church, I want to let you know something. The only tears you should be crying at this altar are tears of joy because God's already forgiven all those things you're ashamed about. That's it. People in the back, y'all can clap if you want to. You're still here. Come on, put your hands together. I will get you guys. You will enjoy yourselves today. Because listen, church, if you're up here and you're crying, it's got to be tears of joy. Because you need to have a knowledge that the same blood that atones for all the wrongs of all the world is the same blood that atones for your wrongs. The same grace of God that is sufficient for all the sins and all the mistakes of humanity is the same grace of God that is extended to you as you weep. And all you have to do is learn to just take those wrongs, lay them in God's hands, and understand that the Bible says he casts them as far as the east is from the west. They just keep going. That's why I love that verse. I was just, just thinking about it as I just said it now, like casting as far as the east is from the west. That doesn't mean that it goes and loops around the planet and comes back to you so you can put it back on you and cry about it. He throws it and it just keeps going. Are you with me? Flat earth theory all the way. It just keeps going. <laughs> Verse 3 says this. Are you still with me this morning? Say yes. And we can be sure. Say sure. We can be sure. Say sure one more time. We can be sure that, it, that we know him if. Say if. Say if. We can be sure we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar. Say it, pants on fire. That person is a liar and is not living the truth. You claim to know God but you don't obey his commandments, the Bible says you're a liar. The Bible says we will know you by your fruits. So many people walking around in church acting like their life is put together, acting like they're living for God, but they're not. Walking around telling people, oh, you just got to be saved like me. Oh, honey, you ain't saved. <gasps> Isn't it funny that... <laughs> that it gets into really dicey territory when we begin to question somebody's salvation. And people say things like, only God can judge me. Anybody ever heard that before? That's a problematic statement. Only God can judge you at the end of your life. You're going to stand in front of God. No man will be there. That's where God judges you. That's what judgment looks like. But on this earth, the Bible tells me I will know you by your fruits. You can't come to me holding up a banana and telling me it's an apple. Girl, I know what apple look like. That's banana. I know me bananas, okay? I am judging you by your fruit. Are you with me this morning, church? If you are saying that you love God, but your actions show something completely different, I can look at you and say, hey, listen, your life is not measuring up with scriptures. The Bible says that the love of God is not in you if you're not walking in him. Are you with me? And for many of us, we go through life just saying something's true, but just saying something is so doesn't make it so. We go through life saying, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. You guys realize that Christianity is the number one religion in the United States in speech, but not in practice? You know what the number one religion is in practice? Atheism. Are you with me? Agnosticism. What's the number one in practice is people that claim a form of godliness but live in worldliness. Are you with me? Are we listening, church? Can I still preach? Verse 5 says this, But those who obey God's word 
truly show how completely they love him. Does anybody in here completely love God? Anybody at all? You completely love God. Yeah, if, you, if you do, you can get excited about it. You can make some noise. You can shout out. You can say, yo, that's me. You can say, I love me some Jesus. You can wave your hand around. You can stand up and do one of these little turns. I'm serious, you guys. I grew up in church. You're not going to freak me out one day. You guys can stand up in your chair. You can put a hand on heaven. Like, I'm completely in love with Jesus. You're not going to mess me up. I'm going to keep on preaching, whether you're quiet, whether you're noisy. But if you're completely in love with Jesus, let me hear somebody shout it out. I'm completely in love with Jesus. Anybody? Goodness gracious. You know, I want to let you guys know, man, you guys are going to get a lot more from today's message if you guys open your hearts to it. Yes. Are you with me? You're going to get a lot more. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely in love they are with him. It's not just enough to say that you're completely in love with someone. you got to show it. That is how we know that we're living in him. Those who say that they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. I think this is such a relevant verse for us, church, living our lives as Jesus did. If we are in God, we live like Jesus. But I think the problem for many Christians is that we're okay with Jesus living for us, but not us living for him. We're okay with Jesus dying for us, but we will never die for him. He literally laid his life down, opened himself up for brutal crucifixion for your sins and for mine. And then he asks you to lay down some of your desires, some of the things that you're fighting for. And we're like, God, I can't. I'm not dying for you, Jesus.
real and honest as I can. And I've seen too much fake in the church and I don't want anything, I don't want any part of it. That's sad. It's a young man. And you know what I'm believing, man? I'm believing that he's about to be a Christian. He just doesn't realize it yet. And that he's going to be the type of Christian that's so authentic that he's going to show everybody else how it's done because he spent too much of his time looking at other people doing it wrong. And so now he's going to step out in faith and say, everyone, watch how it looks. This is what it looks like to love God. This is what it looks like to love others. This is what it looks like to lay your life down. I'm not trying to be fake. I seem fake too much. I'm ready to be real. And what I think will change this world is some people who are not content to settle for fake any longer. For some people that are ready to stand up and say, I'm going to be the real deal. I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to be like Jesus. Are you with me? But I think we've all seen people who have shaken our faith because they claimed to be of God and they were not. One of my favorite quotes of all time is from a man named Brennan Manning, and he said, the greatest cause of atheism in the world is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and carry on with their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And you know, that's the greatest problem. Whenever Americans are polled, their greatest problem with the church is that. It's that. They're judgmental. And they don't even live to the standards that they try to enforce on everyone else. And my hope as your pastor is not to stand up here and try and get you guys to look like something that isn't real. I've been to a lot of churches, man, and and, and there have been occasions where I've gone to churches where everybody looked, acted, and spoke the same. Anyone ever been to a place like that before? It's just like everybody's a cookie cutter of everybody else. Are you with me? Anybody anybody ever seen that before? You just walk in. It's just like there is an ecosystem at work here that's producing something. You walk in and everybody talks the same. Everyone uses the same vocabulary. Everybody, oh, yeah, it's just a trial, just a season, just going through a season right now. It's a season. The Lord's uh, trying to prune me in the season. of Right now it's a trial in the season and the storm. And uh, just praise the Lord. Praise him in the storm. Praise him in the storm. Uh, Praise you, Jesus. You ever, you ever walk in and it's like, like, it was like there was somebody in the church that everyone's like, oh, he looks like a Christian, and then everyone just acted like that person, but nobody's acting like Jesus. Are you with me? I was talking to a, a friend of mine, and uh, she was going to a church in Georgia, and she was like, man, I, I can't tell you how many people have had affairs in this church. It's ridiculous. It's like there's been like 15 affairs since I've started coming that I know about. And then shortly thereafter, it comes out the pastor was having an affair. It's just everybody's imitating everybody. It's a monkey see, monkey do church. And my hope as a pastor this morning is that as I stand up here, you wouldn't try to be like me or anybody else in this room. You would just want to be like Jesus. Amen. That's my hope. Amen. That's my hope. Amen. Verse 7 says this, Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you rather it is an old one you have had from the very beginning this old commandment to love one another is the same message you've heard before yet it is also new why is it new and old at the same time why does this old commandment become new can anyone tell me can anyone tell me because it looks like jesus because it looks like Jesus. Isn't that incredible that this old commandment was one thing and then Jesus stepped in the scene, it became a new thing. Why did that happen? It happened because the commandment was to love and before Christ, people had to define what love looked like for themselves. But once Jesus stepped in the
love, it's meaningless. And I think anybody in here, if you have experienced love, you could say, you know what, take it and burn it all down, just give me real love. You could take your fancy restaurants, you could take your diamond rings, you could take the vacations, just give me real love. Some of you guys are like, no, I will take the diamonds and the restaurants and the vacations, keep your love. You messed up. Anybody that's ever experienced real love knows everything else is a bonus. Without love, we're nothing. We're just darkness. Yet, we let stupid stuff cause strife and darkness, don't we? You guys listen to me. We let some stupid stuff take center stage, don't we? Anybody agree with me this morning? Am I preaching to myself? Is this just to Daniel today? We let stupid stuff become an issue. And stupid stuff stifles love. I was talking with somebody that used to come to this church many years ago, and I was talking to them, uh, man, it was like a couple of weeks back, and they were telling me, man, I need to go back to church. I need to get back into a relationship with God. I need to be back in a community of believers. And I was like, dude, the doors are always open at Victory. 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., you can't mess it up. You sleep in too late, we got a later service for you. People are quieter there, but you get the same message. We have an entire section saved for you this morning. Come. Come. And you know what they said? I'd love to, but I have issues with people that still go there. And they're unresolved. And I can't bring myself to go back to church because those issues remain. That's sad. That's sad. If I'm talking to somebody and I invite them to church and they say no, an acceptable answer to me is them to say, I'm going to another church and God is in that place and I'm being, my needs are being met and I have a relationship with him and they preach from the Bible and, and, and the spirit is there. That's a great answer. God bless you. There are awesome churches out there. I am glad you found one. Accept it and I won't invite you anymore because you have a home. What's not acceptable to me is I'd love to go to your church, but I have conflict with other believers there. And nobody's being the bigger person and just letting it go. Do you have, I had, I had a young guy ask me one time, he goes, what, what, what do you spend the majority of your time on as a pastor, writing sermons? I'm like, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Is it uh, going to the hospital, visiting people? Nope. Counseling? No. You want to know what, honestly, 89.7% of this job is? Dealing with, like, gossip. Not really, not 89%. This is exaggeration. A lot of it, a lot is dealing with gossip. Do you have any idea how many times, like, my phone rings... And it's like, Pastor, so-and-so said this. They did that. And people are calling me up trying to get me to pick a side. I'm like, I'm not trying to pick a side. Y'all both walking around in the dark. I don't want to be blind. Don't try to bring me into your blindness. Don't try to poke my eyes out so I can be in your petty little cat fight. I don't know, what's, I don't know what the issue is, but I don't want to know. And you know what's funny? Is I'll tell people the, the most basic biblical truth. They'll call me up like, what do I do? I'm like, let it go. But I can't, they insulted me. They insulted me. I was, I was disrespected. So was Jesus. They spit on him. They called him names. They ripped his beard out. They beat him. They put him on a cross with a sarcastic slogan above his head. They took his clothes and gambled for it. You haven't been more disrespected than Jesus. Let it go. But I can't. I have to make sure that they understand what they did was wrong. That's between them and God, honey. Let it go. Let it go. Why don't you care about me? I'm just going to leave the church. Ah, do what you're going to do. Do what you're going to do. 
I just wish you cared. I do care. That's why I'm telling you to let it go. Because if you hang on to it, it's just going to eat you up inside. And if you focus on it, that's going to be all you see. And then when you go to church, you're not even going to meet Jesus because all you're going to see is devils sitting over there on that other row. And you're going to be so focused on murdering them, you're not going to be focused on him dying for you. Elsa was right. Just let it go. Please. Oh, my goodness. You're both blind. Are you with me? You're both blind. I don't need to know every detail. You don't have to make sure that I'm up to date on every bit of the minutia of who said what and where. You're both stumbling around in the darkness. Don't be a stumbling block. This pastor says, don't be a stumbling block. Some of you guys are like, with a body like this, I don't really have a choice. <laughs> nah, isn't, you don't look that good. <laughs> Listen, church, don't be a stumbling block. Every time you stifle love, you cover up the light. Every time you push down the love of God that's in you for someone else because of something wrong they did, you're covering up the light and you're allowing darkness into its place. It's Pandora's box. Every time you allow somebody's sin to steal your gaze from the grace of God, you empower the darkness and you shame the cross. Are you listening, man? Jesus is lifted high. And when you're looking at him, man, everything's fine. I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed, I have eternity in heaven. But every so often, man, somebody does something that's just so rancid. You just got to look down from Jesus for a minute and look at what they've done to you. And when you do, you begin to focus on it. You begin to obsess about it. You begin to hang on to it. You begin to think about it, ponder it, grab onto it. Worry about it, stress about it complain about it, gossip about it. And then all of a sudden, you begin to shame the cross of Christ and you begin to empower the darkness because now you're focused on the darkness instead of the light. And you're telling Jesus, listen, Jesus, I know that you died on that cross for me, but your blood is not enough for this. I know that your blood enables me to forgive and to grant grace and mercy where I've been wrong because that's what you did for me even though I deserve it. The Bible says that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me, but they are a sinner and they need to die. Are you with me? When you do that, you're not only setting yourself up for failure, you're also teaching new believers a broken Christianity. You got somebody new that's, that's wandering around watching you and they're trying to figure out how do I do this and you're behaving in such a way where now they think that it's okay to have vendettas against people in their church family. Are you with me? Now they're behaving in such a way where like, oh, wait a minute, this is an issue, isn't it? It's like, like parents, like you ever, you ever, with your children, like you ever just look at them and be like, oh, I just broke you. Anybody, you ever do something wrong as a parent? You ever like scream or something in front of your kids? You ever throw something? Anybody? Perfect parents in this place? Oh, all right. I'm coming over to your house and you're gonna teach me how to do it. You ever do something? I, I've shared this story before, but my kids copy everything I do. Everything. Literally, I will, I, you guys watch me after church. I will leave and I'll hold my boy's hands and I'm gonna walk out into the parking lot. I'm gonna spit. The second I spit, doesn't matter what they're doing, they will spit too. They're doing it. I'm like, dang, I taught them how to spit. I did that. That's what you're doing with other people. You're teaching them a broken Christianity. The people that you're trying to witness to, that you're trying to reach, the family member, you're sitting down with a Thanksgiving and you're trying to invite them out to church, they're never gonna come because they can see your life. Amen? And before long, it's just the blind leading the blind, and we're stumbling into one another. We're creating more collateral damage. And you continuously choose the darkness when you should live like love in the light. That's a killer alliteration for you guys. I am killing it with the L alliterations today. Live like love in the light. I want you guys to do something super middle school for me. Can you guys do something for me? I want you to, to, to 
make the letter L and put it on your forehead for a second. Everybody in here, participate. Participate. You need to walk around with an L on your forehead. Leave it up there for a second. Everyone look around at all the L's on the forehead. I got some people in here that's not doing it. You're like, I am, I am full. I am proud. I am a, an adult. I am not. Do-. do it for me. Look around and say, it's time to live like love in the light. Say it. Say, you look better with an L on your forehead. <laughs> Verse 15 says this, Do not love the world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasures and a craving for everything that we see. And pride in our achievements and possessions. These things are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away. Say, fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Man, we love the things of this world, don't we? Don't we? We love the things of this world, don't we? Y'all went Black Friday shopping. I know how it goes. You know what's funny? Uh, you know what's funny about Christians, man, is we are too timid to witness to a coworker, but we will risk a shanking to get 50% off on a turtleneck. <laughs> we will do it. We will brave the great unknown. We will go to Walmart at midnight on Thanksgiving Day so that we can get $7 off of an RCA TV that you know isn't going to work tomorrow. (laughs) We're going to go to save 87 cents on a pillow. Are you with me? We love the things of this world, right? I'm being real, am I? We love it. I get excited every year. I'm being real about myself. I get excited every year to go Black Friday shopping. Oh, every year. Every year. I finish eating. I tell my family, I love you, but bye. I have to buy things now. <laughs> and I go and I buy movies. that I, I still have movies in the wrapper from last Black Friday. I didn't even watch it. I'm like, $2 for a Blu-ray. Got to have it. It has a little Walmart sticker on it still. I never even opened it, but I needed it so bad. I get so excited. I got this jacket on Black Friday, guys. This is a cool jacket, right? You guys like this jacket? Come on. Is it, I need compliments. I'm really insecure. Come on. Louder. It's a, it's a cool jacket. It's leather and everything. I love it. I'm excited about this jacket. Some of you guys are like, that's a ridiculous jacket. We live in Florida. It gets hotter than the surface of the sun in a frying pan, and you're wearing a leather jacket in Florida. It is 85 degrees outside. Ain't you got no sense, boy? I don't care. It looks awesome. I feel like the Fonz. I feel like John Travolta in a musical right now. Can't nothing. You say, stop me. Are you with me? I saw my brother before church, and he's like, you look like a homeless guy in an apocalypse movie. I'm like, I don't care what you think. Your jeans too skinny, get out of my face. I don't care, I like it. So excited to get this jacket, man, I got a good deal on it too. I was so happy, I left the price tag on it because I wanted to show people how much it really cost before I got the savings. I just really do have the price tag on it, it's not because it's going back to the store. (laughs) I was so excited to get this jacket, but then I started thinking about it, man, I was like, man, I really like deals and and the last time I got this excited, I got, is when I got these boots. Man, I got these boots on a sale too. I, you guys want to know something really crazy? I got these boots for $10. $10. My wife was there. She is the witness. They're originally 90 bucks. I got them for $10. And I was so happy. Wasn't I so happy when I found these shoes? $10. Man, I've been wearing them sometimes, and people give me a lot of compliments on these boots, man. Some guys walk out. It's funny when guys compliment each other because we're trying to, like, be heterosexual when we do it. We're like, man, those are, um, those are good, strong boots. Like those, brother. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know you like my feet right now. <laughs> but then, you know what's funny, man, is I, I had a little bit of a spill a couple of, like, last week or something, and, and I scuffed them. Scuffed the front of my boots. Like, you guys can look on my right boot, right in the front. I don't know if you can see it right now. Can you zoom in on the lens? It's a big scuff on the front of my boot. Looked like a puma got a hold of it. And you know what? This morning when I was getting ready, I go to grab the boots, and I'm like, ah, oh, they're scuffed. I don't know if I want to wear them today, and I got a scuff. I don't want to be wearing them scuffed boots. 
a new jacket and scuffed boots. What am I thinking? I was so excited about them. But you know what? They faded. They faded. So they're not as shiny as they used to be. They don't please me as much as they used to. And I don't really care about them anymore because the scriptures tell us the things of this world are fading. They're fading. Those boots aren't as shiny as they used to be. Are you with me? That car that you just spent your entire teenage life saving up for is a little older now. Your standards have changed a little bit. The things of this world are fading. Ladies, that's true, right? Amen? Like back in my day, back in my day, I was so beautiful. You're fading. I used to be a real head turner. Well, you still are. It's just in the opposite direction. <laughs> Come on. It's a joke. My goodness. I can make fun of men all day long. I make one lady joke. Everyone's like, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm never going back there. He's a chauvinist. <laughs> He's a woman hater. <laughs> Come on. It's fading. It's fading. It's fading. It's fading. I mean, I can be real, too. I mean, I don't know if you guys ever met my dad, but, like, this is going to be fading pretty soon. I'm just, I've come to terms with it. It's going to recede. <laughs> it's just going, it's going south for the winter. It's migrating the opposite direction of my brows. Things fade. Amen. The things of this world are fading. And God in his infinite wisdom told us not to fall in love with them because he knew they would. That high that you're chasing, it's fading. That boy you're pining after, those feelings are fading. And that career that you thought would be the answer, it's fading. The boots, the face, it's fading. And God knew that it would let you down. So he said, put your hope in me. I'm a sure and steadfast anchor for your soul. I'm not going anywhere. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I will never allow you to stumble. I'll never let you walk through the fire and be burned. I'm not going to abandon you. I didn't bring you this far to leave you. I will never let a tear fall from your eye that I don't catch in store. See, I knit you together in your mother's womb. I was there for you before you entered this world. I'll be there for you when you leave it, and I'll be there with you in eternity. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here for you. So don't fall in love with those things that are fading don't put your hope in them because they're gonna let you down and I'm your father and I love you and I want what's best for you so I'm gonna encourage you no matter how bad you want it no matter how long of a line you're willing to wait in to get it don't worry about it let it go because it's fading and I'm telling you not to put your trust in it any longer I'm telling you to let it go I'm telling you it doesn't matter and I have a question for you this morning church do you love the world or do you love God God, when the world looks at your life, do they see you so obsessed with things or do they see you obsessed with him? I'm asking you this morning, church, how important are the things of this world? Because God is telling you they're temporary. Let it go. Just put it down. Lay it on the ground. Kick it to the side because it's not going to satisfy you. It's not going to be beautiful tomorrow. So just get rid of it and put your hope in me because I'm never going to change and I'm never, ever going to fail you. And I will always be enough. When the world looks at your life, what love is more visible, love for the world or love for God? I'm coming to a close. If the worship team could make their way up to the front this morning, we're going to just close in just a few moments. Verse 26 says this, I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray, but you have received the Holy Spirit, and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. Are you listening to me this morning, church? You don't need me to teach you what is true. Are you listening? If you come to church and you're looking and say, Pastor Daniel, tell me what to do, you're going to mess up. 
You have the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to teach you what is true. I can compliment what the Spirit is doing, but I want to let you know I am always going to be a supplement and not the main course. You need to be sustaining yourself in the truth of the Scripture, in the truth of the Word of God, in the truth of the Holy Spirit, and I'm just a bonus on top of that to help point you in a good direction or help give you a little bit of wisdom, but you know the truth not by my words, but by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit that is in you. Are you listening, church? For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know, and what he teaches you is true and it's not a lie. So just as he taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with him so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. In closing this morning, I want you to hear this. The Holy Spirit is in you. If you're in Christ, you've got the Holy Spirit. They're inseparable. You know the truth. You know the truth, and that's why you recognize the truth when you hear it. You know, I had so many people come up to me last week, and, the, the, and they, they, they were talking about the sermon, and the, the most common thing that I heard was I had probably four people use these exact same words. Man, your sermon was so true. Your sermon is so true. How could four people agree that the words that came out of my mouth were so true to use those exact words? It's because the Spirit in me is testifying to the Spirit in you. It's because you know the truth because the Holy Spirit is in you. And when I open up the Word of God and I begin to read out of it, there's something inside of you that says, yes, that's for me. Yes, that's accurate. That might be difficult for me to hear, but it's for me. That might be hard for me to swallow, but I got to. And I know that that is from God. And I know that if I just accept it, some change can happen. You know the truth. The question for you this morning is do you walk in it? Are you walking in the truth? Just knowing the truth isn't good enough. You can know how to get to your destination, but if you don't walk out the path, you'll never get there. Are you listening to me, church? It's time to stop shrinking back in your shame. It's time to stop defaulting back to this place that says there's no reason for me to go forward any longer. It's time for you to stop getting back to this place where you're like, man, God's mad at me, and that's why I'll never be able to be who I need to be. It's time to stop shrinking back because you have an advocate with the Father. Your sins are forgiven, and it's time to walk in love. So lift your head up high and step into the light. There's no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ. You are a new creation. The old things have passed away everything becomes new so stop falling in love with the things of this world stop hanging on to all this stuff that you thought was valuable because it's worthless and it's fading and start running towards God and say I'm not gonna let another issue raise up between me and somebody else in this church because you put me here and I'm gonna be who you need me to be for your glory and I'm gonna forgive and I'm gonna show grace and I'm gonna show mercy and I'm gonna start loving people because when the world looks at my life I want them to see Jesus I don't want them to see me. I don't want them to see my pastor. I want them to see Christ. And I don't want them to see love for the world and the things that fade. I want them to see an example of love for eternal things. I'm in love with Jesus, and I'm walking in the light this morning. Give God a shout of praise.